Président, bonjour, guten tag, buongiorno, bundi. I should not continue with English because English is not a national language of Switzerland. But nevertheless, as usual, we make presentation in English. Uh, before starting, I have two remarks to make. First, I am absolutely delighted to be in Barcelona because I love the books of Manuel Vasquez Montalban. And uh, to work yesterday evening, I missed the dinner because I went on the Ramblas to eat pan in, in tomatado like Pepe Carvalho. And for me, it was a great, great pleasure. We missed you. We missed you yesterday. <laughs> and uh, the second remark is that uh, Switzerland recognizes four languages. This is the fifth language, the sign language. Or, um, we we, we um, recognize four languages for a little country of 8 million inhabitants. If we would follow the same uh, symmetry, uh, South Africa should have 25 national languages, and India should have 626 national languages. So we, we, have, we are fortunate to have a lot of national languages. Let's start on Switzerland. Welcome to Switzerland, uh, home of the legendary quadrilinguismo, quadrilinguism in Switzerland. We see that the reality is not exactly that. Switzerland is famous for its lakes and for its mountains. Usually, when people think of Switzerland, they have in mind banks. This is not the usual state of all Swiss. It's not um, the home of all Swiss. The Swiss knife is uh, also uh, very, very famous. The chocolate, of course. Every Swiss eats at least 12 kilograms of chocolate every year. You can imagine we eat a lot of chocolate. Switzerland is also famous for a myth, the myth of Wilhelm Tell, the, the mythic founder of, of Switzerland. It, in reality, it's not true, but as I shall explain, Switzerland is very important for its mythification of multiculturalism. What is a myth? A popular belief or story that has become associated with a personal institution or occurrence, especially one considered to illustrate a cultural ideal. One has to keep in mind about the languages in Switzerland the fact that modern Switzerland has been created in 1848. 1848 was a time where it was um, the unification of a nation in, in Europe, and Switzerland has made exactly the contrary. We have been founded as a um, unification of cantons. There is no Swiss nation. We are not supposed to make a Swiss nation. And from the early beginning, it was necessary to find some myth in order to unite this country. Uh, yesterday, the, um, the Finnish speaker explained Finland, one nation, <coughs> one government, two languages. In Switzerland, we say 3,000 municipalities, 26 cantons, one country. So we, we, we are used to have diversity, and diversity, also linguistic diversity, has been considered mythically as really an important background for Switzerland. Wilhelm Tell myth or reality, it's not important. What is important is that the myth has become more important than the reality. I shall start with a little presentation of federalism, because federalism is the heart of Switzerland. Also for languages, you cannot understand Switzerland without having an idea on federalism, because federalism is the core system that has allowed us to maintain such a diversity is the key we have here, the 26 cantons in the federal palace. The federalism is a system in which we have two levels of government, the central government and the cantons. We have participation in the center and autonomy in the regions. These are the centralists who are against federalism. I am used to that when I speak of federalism in many central countries. Um, take care. Despite its official name, Switzerland is not a confederation. Switzerland is called Confeder Swiss Confederation or Helvetic Confederation. 
we have preserved the antique name in Latin, but many people believe that Switzerland is still a confederation. It is a very classic federal state. And sometimes I hear European specialists who argue that the future of Europe is not to be a federation that would be horrible, but the best for, for Europe would be to be a confederation like Switzerland. It's completely wrong. This is not the atomium in process. It represents really this idea of the central government and the cantons all around, the cantons who preserve their own rules. Uh, there are many, 25 federations in the world, and we have here Marion and Monroe, but we have Marlon Brando for the ladies, don't worry. Federalism is a source of fantasies, because some consider federalism as the enslavement of the states. And when you speak of federalism in the European countries, they say, no federal Europe, it's impossible. Others consider that it is the first step towards the state's collapse. And uh, when you speak of federalism, I, I had met a delegation of high-ranking um, uh, Ukrainians just before coming here. You, you speak federalism to Ukrainians. They, 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 they just believe that you are the devil. And uh, they don't want to hear of federalism because they, they consider it's the first step towards the state's collapse. It's wrong in, in Ukraine. They are very centralized, but they have the state collapse. And if they are wrong, federalism is a dialectic balance between center and periphery. And you will see that even for languages, we have this balance, this research of the best solution between centralistic and decentralized solutions. Let's go to Switzerland, all starting around 1291. The first canton started to merge, first three, and then a little bit more and more and more. Just to explain to you that from the early beginning, Switzerland was a German-speaking country. And uh, all the cantons were German till the arrival of the canton of uh, Fribourg. But Fribourg was the only one with a little um, uh, French-speaking minority. It's absolutely funny to consider that at that time, Fribourg was a German-speaking canton. And now, if we consider that Fribourg is very strongly attached to the French-speaking majority, uh, it, it's really funny to see how things can evolve in time. So ne nobody knows what can happen in one or two centuries things can change very much. But most of the Fribourg people would be absolutely uh, surprised to discover that, that their canton was primitively German-speaking canton. Then we had the confederation of the 13 cantons for many centuries. And they, this uh, confederation, at that time it was really a confederation, uh, was really only German-speaking. In 1798, what happened in Switzerland? Like everywhere in the world, Napoleon invaded Switzerland, and Napoleon transformed the country. Tr Napoleon transformed Switzerland into an Helvetic Republic, according to the French model. It was a centralized Helvetic Republic. He transformed the cantons, and the cantons were just uh, departments. Um, in doing this, he has transformed some parts of the country which were French or Italian speaking, and these parts were submitted to the German speaking cantons. He transformed these Latin speaking parts into full fledged um, uh, states. At that, at that time, they, they were. Um, uh, I, I, I have forgotten the name. Um, Department. He transformed this into full-fledged uh, department, like Department of Le Mans, Wallis. And in doing this, he created the first multilingualism state in Switzerland. And um, he, he, at, from that time, the laws have started to be written in many languages. After the collapse of Napoleon, the Switzerland has been designed as it is currently. It's, it's really, really uh, unpleasant, this, uh, this noise. Uh, he transformed the, the confederation. No, after Napoleon, 
the, the confederation has been born again uh, uh, according to the old model, and they have uh, decided that the cantons were absolutely sovereign again. A, and as a bad souvenir of the French invasion, they put aside this idea of multilingualism, but at the same time, the confederation was extremely weak and the central organ were almost unexistent. It was only one time a year that the ambassador of the canton met. The, ca the country had no constitution and even no capital. The capital was changing all the time where the, the diet, the assembly of the ambassadors met, and the, the country had no, no money, no capital, no army, nothing. Uh, this lack of central authority drove to a situation in which there was a conflict between Catholic and Protestants. Not that much on religion, but on the idea of the future of the country, because the Catholic wanted to preserve the confederation, and the Protestant wanted to create a federation like United States. The Protestants have won the war. It was fortunately because the Catholic cantons were very weak. It was a very short war with very few casualties. It was, a, as we have in Switzerland, very smooth, <laughs> even, even for the war. And uh, the result has been the creation of modern Switzerland, the 1848 federal state. And at that time, uh, um, just here, it's the Switzerland as it is now. It was created in 1848, and at that time, <clears throat> it has been decided again to recognize the multilingualism of the country because it was necessary. It's the, this idea of mythification of the country. Can you imagine that 1848, it was the time of uh, liberal revolution throughout Europe. And the only country in which the liberal revolution could succeed was Switzerland. It's really, really crazy. And that at a time where the idea was always nationalist, nationalist, national state, Switzerland did exactly the contrary, liberalism and diversity. So it's, it was absolutely revolutionary, but they needed to have this recognition of something extraordinary to maintain the country. It was multilingualism, diversity. Diversity has been and is still the seventh uh, to preserve Switzerland. And from that moment, Swiss authorities needed to take care of their institutions because it was necessary to take care of the democratic life, to take care of the cantons, to preserve the cantons in order to maintain the country together. And this idea of linguistic diversity belonged to that. And at that time, we had an, a provision in the Constitution, a provision that was very wise and very simple, saying the three most spoken languages in the country are the national languages, German, French, and Italian. It's very clever because it was just the recognition of a reality. People spoke German, French, Italian, and it has been recognized naturally as national languages. There is no better way of understanding this mythification of the, of the diversity than the recognition of the fourth national language. 1938, Switzerland was surrounded by the, by the powers of um, the fascists in Italy and in the north of Germany. Uh, the Swiss authorities wanted to find something in order to reinforce the unity of the country. And what did they do? They presented or they proposed to, um, re to, to recognize the fourth national language, Romanche, as a symbol of Swiss unity. Almost nobody speaks Romanche, but in 1938, this recognition of Romanche, which has been accepted by almost 80% of voters, 
uh, this uh, recognition of Romanche has served for preserving the unity of the country. And they succeeded quite well in uh, preserving the diversity of the country because uh, 168 years later, Switzerland always exists as a federal country and a uh, quite successful country. Let's say a word on the languages themselves. <coughs> we have a situation in which it's quite paradoxical because we have a majority of German speakers, we have French speakers, Italian and Roman speakers, but you see that we have a lot of uh, speakers uh, coming from other countries because Switzerland is an immigration country. A lot of people come to, to, to uh, Switzerland, uh, too, many, uh, too many foreigners at the, um, for, for a number of Swiss who regret that there are too many people coming from abroad. And you see that there are an increase of other languages. Some experts ask, should this arrival of so many people break the system or in, is a case for changing the system till now we preserve the system as it has been created many years ago. Nobody wants to touch the system. And you see that there are 64% of uh, German, French and Italian. Romanche, only half a percent of smokers, of, um, of uh, speakers of Romanche and uh, the, um, the number is very small and uh, in fact, there are no ones Romansh speaking, but it's like uh, languages in Africa or in South America. Uh, it's a lot, there are five different dialects in Romansh. What is very important in Switzerland is that the languages are uh, separated according to regions. It's the territoriality of languages. This is a very important element of the Swiss case because you have zones. You have linguistic zones in the country. You have the major zone close to Germany, the German-speaking zone with the German-speaking cantons. You have the French-speaking zone close to France. You have the Italian-speaking zone close to Italy. And you have the spots where people speak Romansh in the canton of Graubünden. What does it mean? It means that according to federalism, where cantons play a most important role in anything, and especially in linguistic policy, most of the cantons are absolutely monolingual. On the 26 cantons, we have 22 cantons which are monolingual. We have three cantons which are bilingual, Fribourg, Bern, and Valais, and we have one canton which is trilingual, it's Guarbünden, which is Italian, German, and Romansh speaking. <clears throat> it's important to have that in mind because many people abroad believe that all the Swiss speak four languages. It's unfortunately not the case because the authorities, the, the school authorities are most of the time unable to really um, organize a teaching of the language in, in such a way that everybody speaks several languages. Uh, now, most of the people speak only one language on their, um, on their, in their canton, only the bilingual canton, but even in the bilingual canton, the border, the linguistic border is extremely strict and has not moved since 2000 years. At the time of Roman Empire, the border between the Roman language, the Latin language, and the language of the barbarian was at the same place that it is now between uh, French speaking and German speaking. It does not mean that the German speakers are considered as barbarians. Uh, by the way, the, the term barbarians was used by the Roman to describe those who spoke another language. And uh, you see, a uh, funny anecdote, when I started my studies at the university, they have invited some guests uh, in order to present the different professions of, of lawyers. And um, in Fribourg, they, they have invited the lady who was the head of the legal service of the hospital of Geneva. It was the beginning of the, um, of the law of the law of health. 
And uh, at the end of her presentation, the, the dean of the university said to her, yes, lady, uh, you have to explain to my students how it is important for them to learn German. And she said, I'm sorry to say that to you, but never in my life I said a single word of German. She was coming from Geneva. And Geneva is a, is a canton in which you have no contact with German. In, in Switzerland, the, the, the linguistic territoriality is extremely strict. And we have, in the, we have uh, uh, invented a, a clever system in which you have different communities. These communities respect <coughs> themselves, but have no contact with them. There are stars in German-speaking Swiss that nobody knows in the French-speaking Switzerland, and so on. And uh, there are stars in, in Ticino that nobody knows elsewhere. And uh, we, 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 every region, every linguistic region keep or remain for us. There are some people who are transgender <laughs> or trans-regional. They can be stars throughout the country, like Roger Federer, or like Marie-Thérèse Porchet, or, or humorists like this, but very few people are able to go be on, on the, both sides of, the, um, of uh, the, the linguistic border. If we go to see how it's enshrined in the Constitution, there is an article uh, of the, um, in the Swiss Constitution, Article 4, National languages are German, French, Italian, and Romance. Recognition of the reality, of the territorial geographic reality. Note that the German, which represents the majority, and someone this morning said the majority never grants uh, something to the minority. We have been fortunate that the majority of German speakers, they have granted uh, something to uh, the Roman minorities, Latin-speaking minorities, and they have recognized these languages of the other minorities. We have Article 18, freedom to use any language. The freedom of language is guaranteed. And we have a famous article. I did not read the article. You will find that in the paper. And we shall explain later all the importance of this uh, article. <laughs> That is the official <coughs> language of the Confederation. The um, paragraph 2 says the cantons shall decide on their official languages. This is linked to federalism because federalism means that the linguistic question is left to the cantons. The cantons can decide, they have to decide, they can do what they want. But we have Article 4, uh, Paragraph 4 and 5. The Confederation shall support plurilingual cantons, and the Confederation shall support measures by the canton of Carbunden and Ticino. This is uh, um, a breakdown of the federal principle, and we shall see that it's not that easy. It has not been very easy to create that. So the four legal principles that are used in, uh, in Switzerland, equality of languages, in so many countries in the world where it's so difficult to have this equality of languages, we have equality of the four national languages. Freedom of citizens concerning the language, territoriality of language, this is very important, this is the most important principle, and the protection of minority language, this is a new trend because it's, uh, as I shall explain later, it's necessary to protect the minority languages. It's no more enough to recognize the minority languages, it's necessary to protect them. If I take the freedom of languages, the principle is easy, people are free to speak any languages, but it's a, it's a nice uh, principle on the private level. You can do what you want of the private level. But it's, uh, its principle is strongly limited in Switzerland because every canton has to define a national language, an official language of the canton. And as most cantons are monolingual, it means that if you live in the canton of Zurich, you can speak every language at home that you want, but everything in Zurich will take place in German. 
the language of the law, of the court, of the administration, of the schools, everything is in German. You have not a single word in another language. Just perhaps the administration will prepare some information notice for foreigners in foreign languages, but everything takes place in German. If you are in Geneva, everything is in French and not a single word will be held in, an, in, in another language. It's why in Switzerland, for instance, the police, police is only cantonal. We have no federal police, we have only cantonal police because nobody would accept to be fined by a policeman from another country. So uh, from another canton, you have to be fined by your own policeman. It's very unpleasant, but only your own policeman. <laughs> the principle of territoriality. It's really interesting because some experts glosses and uh, make big discussions on the principle. For me, it's not a principle, it's a geographic statement because Switzerland does not exist. It's a part of Germany, a part of France, a part of Italy, and the poof, they join together and territoriality is just the nature. What is very intense and very clever is that the founding fathers of the Swiss Confederation, they have respected nature. If I take the case of Ukraine, for instance, I love Ukraine, but they are so... I don't know, I, I don't say the word, but uh, they, they, they have conceived Ukraine as a national country with one language, one, no, no, no decentralization, nothing with such a very important Russian-speaking minority, it could not function. And in fact, it broke. So the principle of territoriality has been recognized because it represents the reality of the country. It has been first defined by the federal court because in the first constitution, very few principle, legal principles were in the constitution. Now it is enshrined in the constitution. <laughs> The essence of the principle is that you don't touch the linguistic borders. And so you protect the minority languages. So the, in, 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 uh, in my canton, for instance, we, we, we consider that territoriality is important. We are in a French-speaking zone, and we don't want to have an infringement by German speakers. You preserve that. But there are critics to the principle because this principle is also used by the German speakers. And there was a famous case of the Supreme Court, uh, which was exactly contrary to the interest of the French speakers because they wanted to create in Zurich a French school for the many people, French-speaking people, living in Zurich. Zurich is the biggest city in, in Switzerland. Many French speakers live there, and they wanted to create, to open a French-speaking school. And in a famous, famous case, the, the federal tribunal said, no, it's not allowed because you have to defend the right of the German population. In Zurich, the German population has an overwhelming majority, but nevertheless, they had to protect the traditional borders of the language. So all the minority languages who consider that principle of territoriality is the best guarantee for the preservation of minority language is perhaps not always the case, because in the case of Zurich, it proved exactly the contrary. If I take <clears throat> implementation of the legal framework for languages, the federal council as an example, you know, in Switzerland, we do not have a king, we do not have a head of state, we had a federal council. We have seven people, seven wise people. There are eight on the picture because on the official picture, you always have the secretary of the council. He's the little man on the, on, on the side. He looks at the other with great admiration <laughs> because he would love to be member of the, of the council. What is really interesting is that the, the seven, and this, this um, the way of, the, um, of uh, composition of the Federal Council illustrates very well the, the, the change of, um, of uh, paradigm or of importance in life. When the idea of the Federal Council has been created in 1848, the idea was to have seven cantons represented. At that time, only men, made politics, and the only, there was only one political party. 
With the time being, we have introduced several parties. Now it's a tradition that the Federal Council has four different political parties. There is necessary uh, a certain number of women, this is a gender necessity, and the most acute element is the fact that they must have French speakers and German speakers. All, the, the first Federal Council at that time, it was already the case they had one French speaking and one Italian speaking member of the council. And now it's really <coughs> incredible because I, I cannot explain, so it will be too long to explain the history of that, but it's really fascinating because <coughs> on the seven, we have three French speakers. Can you imagine three French speakers on seven? It's an over, over representation of French speakers, but we are very happy. Uh, in, especially because they are, they are quite good. The president uh, in Switzerland rotates every, every year. Everywhere we have a new president. The president is only primus inter pares. Today it's Mr. Schneider Hamann who speaks uh, French, uh, we, we say like an um, Austrian, no, um, 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 Spanish co. He, he does not speak French very well, but it's not a problem. You, you know, <coughs> Um, this idea of respect, respect of all languages, is, is very important in Switzerland. And th this is uh, a fact that this is really funny. Um, when uh, Switzerland wanted to join the Francophonie, the International Agency of Francophonie, the Federal Council said, it's difficult because we are not a French-speaking country. We have a majority of German speakers. So they have asked all the cantons, uh, do you agree? And all the, the German-speaking cantons said, no problem, you can join. Then at that time they said, yes, we join. And the first person, the first president who um, took part in the Francophone meeting spoke German. That was, uh, <laughs> it was it's, it's really f fascinating. Modulation of the official status of languages. <clears throat> the moving relation are buried between territories. It would be too complicated. I have not enough time just to say that in these discussions, I, I have enough for five minutes. Theoretically, in, in 10 minutes, we should stop. What do you think? But we, we, but, but we started later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. Uh, the, the, you have more. You, have more. <laughs> you are allowed. The, the, these relations buried between territory and I, I, I bring you to, to, the, to the bibliography because it's very difficult legal question concerning only the very few municipalities which are on the linguistic border because these discussions between territoriality and freedom of languages exist only in the very few places where you have this meeting. Because the linguistic border crosses the mountains, the rivers, where you have nobody living there. But only in few places, like in my town, they, they touch and then you have some people complaining. For instance, they would like, they speak German, they live in a city where people speak French, they would like to, to send their children at the German-speaking schools, and the authorities say, no, 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 territoriality, and they say, please, 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 and now the, the, the courts tends to give more priority to the freedom of languages. It's a shift that it concerns only very few people, it's not, from a legal point of view, it's very important. Uh, recognition of the official use of English. It's a big problem in, in Switzerland because, of course, I don't know if I have no, it's not that. Um, as all speakers have said, it's a danger. First, fortunately, English is not an official uh, language of Switzerland because nobody speaks English in Switzerland. Uh, <coughs> the fifth national language that could be good because, the, unfortunately, the authorities, and I, it's really, really sad, the authority is unable to, to, to prepare the children in such a way that they speak two or three languages. That would be so easy, but they do not. And uh, there are always less and less people speaking all the languages. By the way, 
it's quite complicated because the French speakers, they speak French from France. But the German speakers, they do not speak German from Germany, they speak local dialects. And for us French speakers, it's almost impossible to speak these dialects. It's very complicated. I've been working with German speakers since uh, 30 years. I do not speak a, a, a single word. For me, it's like Chinese. It's absolutely impossible to understand people speaking Swiss German. <coughs> Swiss German is a very strange language, and it's very difficult for us to understand. And uh, as long as Swiss German have learned French, it was very easy for the mutual um, understanding because the Swiss German spoke French. That was good. Now French has lost its influence, lost its prestige, uh, like Slovenian, and uh, they do not want to speak French, they speak English, and uh, it's, it happens very often that Swiss speak English between themselves. I regret that very much. And there is a second problem. It's the, uh, we have seen that everywhere. The monolingual universities, they propose uh, masters in English because if you do not propose masters in English, it's the problem of Bologna system. Uh, we had, unfortunately, the, the Finnish guest is no more here, but uh, we discussed that with him. All these uh, universities with uh, seldom languages lost, lose their importance because they have to do masters in English. Uh, Pantahai, everything changes, and now we have a paradigm shift. Oh, it's not that important, but the fact is that on March 10th, 96, we voted an amendment of the Constitution that is, has been retaken in um, the last Constitution, is the fact that quadrilingualism becomes pride and wealth. It means that previously we just recognized these languages. It was the, the four languages were recognized. But since 96, it is considered as more than simple recognition. We have to defend that. It becomes necessary to defend and to protect and to improve the, the communication. It it's becomes a dynamic recognition. And uh, at <coughs> all levels, this way is important to, to give, to try to do something. They have created a federal law on national languages in order to improve the, uh, the, the, the communication, the understanding. It's very limited at, because cantons play the most important role. But what is absolutely incredible is that the, um, the political parties entered in the game and the populist parties this is really crazy. The populist parties in Switzerland, the Swiss People's Party, is against any improvement of the linguistic status. They always pretend that Switzerland is the coronation of the world. We are the best country in the world. But in fact, they undermine all the elements that make the value of the country. And they want to destroy all these things. They fight against recognition of French. They fight. They didn't want this law. They, because, and this law is so, so small. In, uh, in Fribourg, also the political will, because in Fribourg, they have enshrined in the new constitution of the canton the territoriality. You look, you see this is the map of the canton. In Fribourg, we, have, we are the contrary of Switzerland. We have a majority of French speakers and a minority of German speakers. And in Fribourg, the French speakers are very proud because we can have the revenge. <laughs> on, the, on the national sense, we are minority, but in the canton, we are the majority. We are very proud and we want to revenge ourselves. <laughs> and therefore, we want to limit the influence of the German speakers. By the way, I have to tell you a very interesting, a very funny anecdote. In my city, the city of Fribourg, which is monolingual, but we have a strong uh, German-speaking majority, the German-speaking majority, a uh, minority, asked for placing at the train station uh, panels Fribourg, Freiburg in German. And at that time, 20 years ago, and the French speakers, 
were shocked. They said, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's not possible. It's a sweeping Germanization, creeping Germanization. It's an invasion of Germany. It was almost a civil war. And who is responsible for the panels? It's the society of, of the trains. It's a federal society. So it was a long, 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 long process. Meanwhile, the most acute defenders of French died. And uh, it, it, that's the point. And 20 years later, the, the administration of the trains decided to change the panels. And a friend of mine, who is the mayor of Fribourg, told me, can you imagine, we had, a, we had the other day the inauguration of the new panels. Nobody was there. Nobody was there. This point that was so important, that gave a rose, almost a civil war in the, in the canton, when it has been realized, nobody had the slightest interest. Now we have these panels, Fribourg, Freiburg. So you, you see, the politicians or the, the, the extremists can play a very bad role in, in putting oil on the, on the fire. So we, we have this law in, in the Constitution. It's written in Fribourg. Um, political will in the canton of Tessa and Ticino they have created an Italian-speaking university. It's the only Italian university in the world outside Italy the, in order to defend Italian language. You have to take your destiny in the hand. In the canton of Graubünden, they also, this is a very complicated map of the canton. You have German speakers, you have Roman speakers, you have Italian speakers, and they have taken a law Look at this. It's the only time in your life that you will read a text in Rishun, in Roman Rishun. It's, a, it's a, a law that says that from a certain point of a certain percentage of inhabitants in a municipality, the municipality has to create schools and administration in Roman in order to save Romans. And you have here Bivio, it's the only trilingual municipality in Switzerland. A uh, brand new problematic link to defense. Two minutes, I'm finished. As I told you, dynamic, dynamic defense of languages. Now we enter in a problematic because in all the Swiss cantons, it was used it was said that at the primary school, you learn your normal languages and the second Swiss language, meaning in, in uh, French-speaking Swiss, you, speak, you learn German. In German-speaking Swiss, you learn French. But now in all Swiss-German cantons, the um, uh, Swiss People's Party, the, the, the Populist <coughs> Party, has launched initiatives saying, no more, no more French, only English. You know, they, they want to, to preserve the, 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 the interest of the, the people. They say, uh, no French, French is the language of the elite, is not interesting, only German. And now this is a great problem. And we are asking, we are questioning, would it be necessary that the <coughs> federal council intervenes the federal government, sh should it intervene in order to protect <coughs> the Swiss, uh, the French uh, language at school? It could be um, counterproductive if a federal vote would say that the German speakers, the majority, don't want to have French. It's very tricky, very, very tricky political issue. We have the same problem with the it's more private, the French chair at Zurich University the government has decided to erase no more study of, of French at the Zurich University. My conclusion, does official status matter? Yes, of course. The contrary would be just dramatic. Uh, this is the case of Ukraine. Uh, it's not enough. Strong political will is needed at all level, at the central level, at the level, at the local or cantonal level. It's a very important to have a strong political will in order to make this survive. Otherwise, uh, you can recognize many languages, but it's not enough. Uh, also, a constant adaptation to new circumstances. Things change. Pantahei. 
things change all the time. It's necessary to take that into account. <coughs> it's the dynamic linguistic policy that is really necessary. And it's just for me to say thank you very much for your attention.